Hi, this is Josh Beiser from GameWisdom.com. Hope you enjoyed this critical thought, a detailed discussion on game design, and be sure to subscribe and you can pitch future critical thought topics. Alright, for today's critical thought, we're returning to the topic of boss designs, and specifically the different varieties there are in video games. Now, in our previous talk, we brought up discussion that any video game, be it a puzzle game like, um, Puro Puro or Space Chem to Match 3, Catherine, you name it, any kind of design can have a boss battle in it. But when it comes down to it, a designing a good boss fight is very tricky. And when I think about things further, there are a few major categories of bosses that we've seen. The first kind of fight is essentially a, I like to call it a rival fight. This is when you're fighting a character of similar or even equal skills to the player's character. And typically we see this in action-based titles. Everything from Neo, Bayonetta, Devil May Cry, Ninja Gaiden, uh, pretty much pick a popular action game of the last decade and probably features a rival fight of some kind. Rival fights are some of the more interesting battles and personally I think some of my favorites because these kinds of battles usually don't give the bosses any kind of special tricks or anything that basically breaks the rules of the game. It's just pretty much about skill versus skill. Another really good example would be some of the battles we see in Bloodborne with the Hunter's Fight, uh, Dark Souls when you get invaded by Red Phantoms. Again, the major point behind a rival kind of battle is that both sides are considered equal. Now, because of that, it's not really seen as often as I would like, especially in RPG games, when bosses are given unique advantages or considerations. So, the second kind of boss battle are the ones where the bosses are unique. This is when the enemy is given a special feature or special advantage that distinguishes it from the player or from other enemies my friend over here of course, or the Big Daddy, would be an example of this. When you're fighting the Big Daddies in Bioshock, you're not going to be fighting them toe, uh, hand to hand or toe to toe. These guys, Mike, this thing is heavy too, <laughs> these guys have unique abilities, they have more health, they can charge you, and they're typically considered all around different from what the player has in store for them. Another really good example of this would be stuff like the Colossi from Shadow of the Colossus. And how each boss in that game is designed to be completely different from one another, and obviously completely and 100% unique from the player. The player will never get the same abilities or advantages as any other Colossi, and you can also look at a game like Fury as well. Now, you may have noticed my little friend over there, Donkey Kong would be, or from the classic Mario games, Donkey Kong would be considered an example of an abstract boss fight, wherein the boss itself, it's not really a fight in the same sense as when you're dealing with our friend the Big Daddy or the Colossi, but he basically represents a unique obstacle in the play. A, as I said a few minutes ago, the games like Space Chem and Catherine would be good examples of these kinds of unique boss situations. In Catherine, if you didn't play the game, it is a 3D box sliding puzzle where you need to organize and shift different uh, size, or I'm sorry, different boxes to create makeshift ladders up a tower. So the bosses aren't, aren't essentially competing with you, but they introduce a unique twist and are generally horrific too if you've ever seen footage of them. So one boss would basically randomly destroy cubes, thereby restricting your way up. Another boss may send attacks or shockwaves up the tower that if you don't dodge will kill you or knock you off. And of course, Donkey Kong over here would be of course an example of a boss that is throwing barrels at you and stuff along those lines, especially in the uh, GBA Donkey Kong game that added in unique takes and level designs. 
Typically, in these situations, it's considered fair by the fact that it's not fair. The player has his or her own set of skills over here. The boss has their own. And it's basically about how do you use X to deal with the boss's Y. And again, we can look at games like the Soul series as a really good example of unique fights. Again, we talked about the hunters or the invaders in the last part. But you can look at any monster size boss in Soulsborne as a good example of a unique fight. Um, my goodness, we could just go down the line here. Everything from things like um, Mirror Knight, the... Oh man, now I'm going to piss off the Souls fans so I can't remember any of the names of these bosses. Uh, Champion Gundir, uh, the Prince... Uh, oh my goodness. Again, there's just so many to talk about that my brain is just blanking out, but I'm sure you get my point. Now, like I said, unique battles work in the sense that we each have our own pool of abilities. In the Soul series, bosses are typically going to be very dangerous, of course, with the larger ones able to cover a farther range in terms of battle. The player, of course, has the advantage of being agile. And obviously being controlled by a human means that you're a lot more reactive. Now when things get very interesting, and I think in my opinion very polarizing, is when we're dealing with the third kind of bosses. And these are the ones where they are essentially given unique abilities or conditions that in a manner of speaking can break the rules of the game. For instance, you could have a boss fight where if your entire game is a first-person shooter or shooting elements, this is a boss that requires hand-to-hand -hand combat. And an example I go back to a lot would be what they do in the Dead Rising series. Especially Dead Rising, I think, 1 and 2 both end with a hand-to-hand -hand fight or a melee fight rather than what you traditionally use. A really polarizing example, and this is the, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about in this video, is from the Dragon Quest series. And I believe this would be, I want to say, 7? But it could be 8. This is the PlayStation 2 one that was released, I don't even know how many years ago. In Dragon Quest, or in what this version of Dragon Quest, you get the ability to raise your party's tension up. Think of it as the DBZ equivalent of powering up your character. And when you hit 100, you can keep charging up for a chance to enter a state of super high tension, aka going Super Saiyan. And when you go Super Saiyan in Dragon Quest, your next ability will basically have its potency magnify. If you're going to use a healing skill, it's going to heal almost everyone up to full health. If you're going to use an attack skill, it's going to do, I don't even know, maybe like 5 to 10 times more damage than your normal attack. And one of the major parts about Dragon Quest, especially with some of the layer bosses, is using tension basically to overwhelm your enemy with fewer but stronger attacks. And this works for pretty much the first half of the game. And then what happens is um, when you enter, I think it's called like the Other World or the uh, Monochrome World, all the bosses from that point forward gain a new ability. And it's never referenced in game, it's never brought up in the game's lore. It's based, I think it was called like Diamond Dust, um, Diamond Storm, something along those lines. And what it does is that it basically counters any buffs to your party. That includes anything that raises your attack or defense, and clearing your tension. And the boss can make use of it almost at any time. Sometimes you can get lucky and get all the way up to full tension. Other times, he can basically use it when you're like three-fourths of the way there, and you just lost the last three turns for that character. And this goes back to my topic when we talked about uh, Ludo mechanical dissonance, or when the mechanics of the game are basically used against the player. And I want to ask you folks, what did you think of that kind of rule change or that rule break? Now, another reason I'm going to bring my little friend here into the picture just so you have something else to look at. Another example recently would be from the game Immortal Plan, which of course there are a few major streams of it here. And what happens is a major part of the game is uh, either 
force the enemy to waste their stamina or to attack to lose stamina to get them to the point that you can punish them with a stun. And this is a major part of fighting multiple enemies and just trying to deal with the fact that the enemies are just so overwhelmingly powerful. And what ends up happening is that the uh, final bosses or the final set of bosses in the game basically break this rule. They have attacks that will not drain stamina, thereby making it impossible in some cases to get them to the stun point to punish. Well, of course, they can certainly punish you, and if you run into them while you're trying to dodge around them, you can basically stun yourself, which during a boss fight is pretty much suicide. But this is the where boss battles get very tricky in terms of their balance. They have to be unique enough to offer a specialized challenge, but if you basically bend the game's design backwards over to accommodate, it can lead to very frustrating parts. One Another go-to example, I can use him to point too, another go-to example is from The Suffering 2. And for fans of Game Wisdom, especially longtime fans, I think you know this example. But in the game, you're given like your uh, monster form or your berserk form, whatever you want to call it, that is used to basically do massive damage to enemies and recover your health. And what they introduce for the final boss is not only do they make him immune to traditional weaponry, but they introduce an attack that can actually knock you out of this form and drain your whole special meter in the process. And at no point in the game is an attack like this ever referenced or even introduced. It's basically a one-time impact for the boss that is, again, I feel it's kind of breaking the rules of the game. And again, you have to be careful around that when you're designing bosses. Because if you, again, if you make things too unique, it's seen as you just trying to, I think I said when we talk about little mechanical dissonance, stitch your game's design together with duct tape. Now, a really great example of the unique boss situation, and another go-to one for me, is the Mr. Freeze fight from Batman Arkham City. And if I ever do a dissecting design on that game, I have to show that boss off, because it's a brilliant example of creating a unique situation that really is not copied in that capacity anywhere else in the game, but it works to provide a unique test for the player. And ultimately, that's what a good boss should do. It should test the player to see how well they have mastered the game's systems and how well they can adapt to a unique fight. With our friend Big Daddy over here, advanced play involved you could set up electrical trip wires using the crossbow to stun and then do damage. You could use like a hypnotic ability to send the Big Daddy to fight other enemies and soften them up for the kill. And again, the limits or the options are only limited by your imagination and what's available in the game. But that said, we're going to wrap things up here for today. I'll give you one last, you know, zoom in of this figure. I should have showed this to Bill Gardner when I had the chance. But thank you so much for watching today's Critical Thought. If you enjoy things, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Check back for daily discussions on game design here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. And until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. And come back around 10 Eastern for regular streaming. For a collection of my writings, as well as weekly podcasts on game development, be sure to check out game-wisdom.com. Follow me on Twitter at GWBicer for updates throughout the day. And to help support everything that I do, you can find me on Patreon under GWBicer or Game Wisdom. Your donations can help to keep things running, and we hit some goals, it will mean more content for everyone to enjoy. So, thanks again for watching, and be sure to come back for daily discussions on game design on the Game Wisdom channel.